Welcome back to Ripe Reviews. Today we're talking about Inertia, remaking The Crow from 2001. The documentary about the other Crow remake from 1994. I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. And I'm Connor That's So Draven McGraw. That's so Draven, yeah, yeah, yeah. Connor, ah! welcome back, dude. What is going on? I'm back in the void. You're back in the void. You're back in the dumpster, dude. It looks more like a void on Zoom because the light behind me just completely flushes out. Now it looks like I'm in some kind of physical space. Is that where your soul goes after you die and the crow picks you back up and you come back? It's where I imagine I am when you turn the TV off and I disappear for a while. Gotcha. <laughs> right. the, the, the static, right? You're in there with, uh, 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 who's the little girl from Poltergeist? Oh, uh, Kylie O'Rourke, of course. She's running around in there. Maybe Jeffrey Jones is there. We don't know. I, I, oh, no, get him out of here. I don't want him here. He's in the ocean, his last I heard. Uh, sharks are chasing him. He's not allowed in the void. Connor's like Mike TV, you know? He's up in the fucking atoms <laughs> until he comes back there out. There you go. Floor. Now we're talking, who's getting shrunk down <laughs> to the size of a fucking uh, Hershey bar? Me, hopefully. I can eat that whole Hershey wow, bar. Wow, that's the one big Hershey bar. I was going to say Max Headroom, but that's better. Uh, and yes, we're not here to talk about a Monster in the Closet, uh, obviously featuring not Hershey bars, but Crunch bars, but The Crow. Uh, specifically, like like Joe said in the beginning there, the documentary on the remake <laughs> of The Crow, but not the new one, the one from 30 years ago. So 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 let me lay this down for you bef- before we, we get into this. So yes, we want, we wanted to do a Crow episode, okay? Crow Jason, with, yes. With, with the Crow remake, already out yes and almost already out of theater <laughs> on this recording <laughs> oh, the crow remake from 2024 hits streaming in two days on friday the 13th oh yeah i didn't know that i only knew that it ate shit i didn't know they gave up on it <laughs> well oh they gave up on it big time because we were supposed to do this episode in august oh yeah remember we were talking about it for august when it first came out yeah well and then wasn't this supposed to come out in like June too? I think so. The the re, the 2024 Crow was supposed to come out earlier this year and they pushed it back to September. And again, it I just think it's fucking hilarious that like on the eve of recording this the the fucking movie's coming to streaming in 2 days. <laughs> yeah, well, it hasn't even been out for a fucking week. We're going to talk about that probably towards the end of this uh, yeah. review. Uh I I I went to not even my local theater. I had to drive half an hour just to find a theater that was showing this fucking thing. And it was one showing in the afternoon. Thank God it was like the 25% off. So I only spent like $14 between me and my wife. I didn't mind as much. And I was like, all right, that's a movie. The fact that you drove 30 minutes to go see the I, fucking right, yeah. Crow remake. If I wasn't doing this show, I would not have. I'm going to outdo that right now. I couldn't be fucked to leave my room to go see this movie in theater. So I didn't. And in exchange for supporting Saw for this many years, Lionsgate, you cannot have my money for this reboot. So, <laughs> and the difference fair, between me liking Saw is I'm obsessed with Saw and I love The Crow. There's a big difference. One is very unhealthy and one I adore deep down in my soul. <laughs> right. One's the junk food, one's the art thing, right? Yes. So, so yes, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, Crow remake towards the end of the episode. We really wanted to highlight the other Crow remake for this episode, which is James O'Barr's The Crow, directed by David Ullman and Matt Jackson from 1994. And this is the documentary that goes along with it. And the the whole reason I found out about this movie was from this documentary. Now, our buddy uh, Josh over at Lunch Meet VHS had released uh, Inertia, uh, remaking The Crow a couple of years back. And I was keeping, I was saving this for a rainy day, fellas. Once we, once the crow, <laughs> before remake, you even knew the remake was happening. Once the crow remake got announced, I was like, "That's what we're doing." So what's funny about that too is, um, you can actually, uh, Josh actually did a re-release of this like recently. So you oh, can go okay. to lunchmeetvhs.com right now as of this recording, as of this drop, and buy this on VHS if you want to go check it out. Now. The actual film, James O'Barr's The Crow, that was directed, the the first remake from 1994 that was directed by David Ullman and Matt Jackson is up on YouTube for free on the Lunch Meet uh, VHS YouTube if you want to check out the whole film, which we highly recommend. But if you want the documentary, it's exclusively from uh, lunchmeetvhs.com on tape. Check it out and grab, grab your copy. Um, so yeah, we, I really wanted to talk about this, uh, but we will be talking about... Uh, the legacy of the crow, the crow sequels, and the remake 
towards the the last the ass end of this episode and right in the beginning we're going to talk about the original film and of course this first remake um and this documentary so with that being said yes when was the first time you guys saw this movie what does it mean to you and how do we feel about the original brandon lee crow movie which which before connor we're gonna let you go first as our guest but (laughs) you He's laughing because he, I feel like he knows what I'm going to say. I'm ready to, I'm ready to uh, explode. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you've been following the show for years and you listen to those old episodes when Connor was still a major facet on this show, he's a major Crow fan. So yes. it made sense. Like, who are we going to talk to about the fucking Crow? Of course, Connor McGraw is the man. So, Absolutely. Connor, take it away. I fucking love this movie. I rented it from A to Z video. You know, that's the video store we all went to as kids. Um, Rented it a bunch of times. Saw actually City of Angels before I saw this one, but this one had an enchantment on me that never broke. And then I dated a girl for a long time who loved this movie and The Notebook, which I'm sure I've mentioned before. And we just kind of watched those two on rotation for about half a decade. Um, so on one end, I was miserable. and the other end, I was having the time of my life. I fucking love this movie. It's such a me movie. Mm. It's it's great, dude. Um, so that was the only one I watched really in preparation for this episode because I want to kind of just refresh. I know that I love The Crow. I, it's a great movie. It's a great action movie, great comic book movie from early 90s. But like I hadn't seen it in so long. So when I went back to it uh, a couple days ago, I was like, man. This fucking movie rules. Like, it's really good. And it's like kind of... <laughs> it kicks so much ass. It, it, it kicks so much ass and it's dripping with atmosphere and mm. it's dripping with style and it's just, it's sexy and it's dark and it's gothic and it, there's some magic and there's supernatural shit to it. It just feels really good. Brandon Lee is simultaneously a movie monster who gets to say Arnold Schwarzenegger one-liners. Like, he'll do something completely monstrous and terrifying and hor- like horribly violent and then be like, eat your vegetables and walk away. Like, <laughs> I forgot how fucking cheeky he was in the movie. Yes. And that kind of so like funny. took me off a little bit because I was like, oh, I didn't. Rem- oh, OK. Yeah, there. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. It totally works, though. It's all it's all good shit. Um, it was great to see. Uh, what's his face? The guy from uh, Tales from the Dark Side, uh, Slippage and the Warriors play uh, T-Bird. I forget his oh, name. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fire it up. Yeah. Um, I anyway, looked this all up the other day and I already forgot. He's all, it's okay. It's all right. But, you know, I just, I, I, he was great in it. They're all really good. And uh, what's his face? The dude from uh, Robin Hood who gets stabbed by uh, 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 Snape. Um, I forget that guy's name. <laughs> oh, Alan Rickman. Alan Rickman. Well, he gets stabbed by the, Alan Rickman. He's the sheriff of Nottingham's cousin in Prince of Thieves. Kevin Costner, Robin Hood? Yes. I have no idea. Oh, okay, <laughs> he's, yeah. he's like a he's like a sub boss in that movie who gets dispatched by the sheriff of Nottingham like <laughs> in the first thirty minutes or so. But he has a very distinct voice, and in this movie, he looks and sounds fucking incredible. He looks like a fighting game character. The guy with the fucking swords, the uh, yes. top dollar. Is that yes. About? Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Top oh, dollar. Yeah. Yeah. His fucking his yeah. majestic oh. ass wig and all the swords. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is that, that the sweet. main bad guy that Dude, looks like John Carmack? He looks like fucking or John Romero. Excuse me. What are you talking about? He looks like the fucking Goblin King walking around at the <laughs> end, dude. Oh, a little bit. Yeah. I'm thinking of the creator of Doom specifically. Oh. oh. Uh, Romero, Carmack, uh, he's the other guy. You remind me you of the crow. Me, Who? What crow? Yeah. Also, some some, some sibling fucking in that film. Uh, his 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 sister from his father's uh, side or oh, something. Oh yeah, shit. The, yeah, the, the Asian woman. <laughs> hey, but guess got- what? Hey, guess what? There's two movies in a row in this franchise where there's the there's a uh, token villainous Asian sidekick. So get ready for that. Oh, they had to bring it back right for the sequel. They're like, people aren't gonna get it. <laughs> Yes, played by Thuy Tran. But, but it was so nice to see Ernie Hudson, because I remember him, he was in it, and he's great in it. And Tony Todd is a great, like, oh, yeah. side uh, henchman character that I really like. I love Ernie Hudson in this movie. I think he has a certain levity about him that makes the saddest parts of this really awful, tragic story feel very light at times. Uh, one of my favorite scenes of the movie is when he finds Eric in his apartment and they have that weird exchange and he kind of like he's being cheeky about him being a ghost and he's like, you're going to disappear on me? And Eric says, with all the sadness in the world, nah, I think I'll just walk out the front door. I'm like, Aah. yeah, <laughs> pain, that's for sure. Ernie's in a lot of pain just kind of watching things happen through this show. Even that, like, I think it's like a bar or something burns down later on in the movie. Uh, but actually, this was my first viewing uh, in preparation for really? this, for this uh we're talking about inertia. Uh, we've been talking about this film again on and off for like seven years now. And, you know, 
It's been out since 1994. What am I waiting for? But finally watched it. Liked it quite a bit. I feel like this would have hit me harder if I did actually watch this in 94. Uh, but my only connection to this film for the last 30 years was WCW Sting. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even a big WCW guy, and I think I've maybe seen two Sting matches in my life, to be honest. If you ask Sting Steve Borden, he's like, I've never seen The Crow. Shut the fuck up. Yes, you have. You can't he power had, bomb all the time. But I've seen clips of Sting, and Sting obviously leaned into that. He obviously changed his whole tire to kind of match the crow, and there's documentaries. I've actually seen more documentaries about it than I've actually seen matches of Sting in the ring, but that's a different <laughs> uh, ball of wax, I guess. But uh, obviously then this was a huge phenomenon in the early 90s, and I, I wasn't a part of the goth culture, uh, but... I know that was a huge thing at the time and to this day, and uh, that's why some things in the in the remake kind of make me scratch my head. Of like, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, but but just this first first viewing, a lot of it holds up. All the comic book stuff, I really like how they did a lot of that stuff. Especially the '90s, they were still figuring it out. Like Batman and Superman put forward a lot of ideas, uh, but but they kind of ran with it in this. But we this Sin is, City's still ten years from this, you know. Oh yeah, but we were talking about even like how the mask kind of feels. Two yeah, different yeah. two totally different movies, mask, but they yeah. came out around the same time and like the way that uh I guess New York, right? How New York feels in the it's kind is of it like supposed to be New York? I don't know. It's what, like what, it's so it's like a Gotham where it's like it could be in any like it could be in any crappy location on the East Coast, basically. Right. Okay. I always just assume Detroit because I feel like especially in the eighties and nineties, any bad place, it's like it's Detroit. Well, New York was real bad. In no, the 80s. it was. It was. Um, uh, if you go by the belief that the city in the Crow City of Angels is the same city because of a very specific reason, then it's called the City of Angels and it's just a shithole. We'll get to that, but I thought that was literally like Los Los Angeles. It might be, but it, yeah, they they specifically refer to it as City of Angels. I mean, he is he is a Latino crow in that too. God, yeah, yeah, okay, yes, but there's a very specific thread that leads me to believe it's the same location. Gotcha. Mm. But to the, to that point, it's very comic booky, and and it kind of gives the Pulpy. same. When when you see Edge City in the mask, it kind of gives you that mm. same kind of idea or kind of feeling. But I mean, it's very much like gothic gotham uh style but it very much feels like a comic book it feels great dark man esque again like yeah. that era of comic books that aren't like your stereotypical batmans and spider man sure. just these these kind of like dark horse or or side uh uh, publications that are doing one-off, right, uh, right. one, one, like uh, image or dark horse, <laughs> right? Or yeah. Like that, yeah, they do the one or two trade paperbacks. The series is done, but it just blows up because it's popular. Sure, that one shot of it's not Brandon; it's a stand-in because this was all stuff they filmed after he passed, where he gets the face paint on and it pans out from the broken window, and that building he's in just kind of like just keeps stretching upward, like little hands into the sky. All these like, like I said, the gothic structures all around, and it pans all the way out. It's Fucking awesome! Yeah, it's it's really cool, and I was I was um, visually stunning. Would yeah, be a good I, word to I was use, or phrase to use. I was surprised at um, how uh, compelling a lot of the visuals are and how pretty they were. I didn't re I don't I didn't remember too much of that, and like all of the action scenes are really fucking good too. He's like a slasher villain. Yeah, he is a little. It, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's really cool, man. The way he dishes out his vengeance. Yeah, when he kills fucking Manelli in his. Uh, yeah. Right. In his pawn shop, that that's fucking great. Is that gasoline I smell? Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, no, it's piss. Because remember, Bushwhacked, he gets pissed on. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me that this movie and the second movie have some of my favorite instances of just awkward swearing. Because like this dude's like shit on me for like two and a half minutes straight. Shit on me. <laughs> oh yeah, he keeps saying that. <laughs> and then later on, I'm I'm pretty sure a cop like. He something happens. And he drops his coffee and goes, "What? The, what the crap?" Like Connor, you're talking about the part when there's like a car chase and the one cop just floors yes. it and the other one's got the coffee. And he spills, spills it on him. Over him. <laughs> what the crap? <laughs> the other one throws it out the window. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, uh, so I saw this film as a kid, and and like I feel like my parents watched this right, like when it came on cable, and I remember uh, being like creeped out by it especially about the scene with fun boy when he corners him in his like room and he's like doing drugs that always like creeped me out like as a kid and when he grabs uh darla by the arm and like squeezes all the heroin out of her or morphine he calls it um that always like freaked me out and i remember that vividly but i didn't really get into it because uh, until i was in my teens because at that point like hot topic had had a lot of like crow stuff and like you know how like i feel like there's this teenage void where like <laughs> bands from bands from the 60s 70s and 80s and like early 90s and like the crow and like edward scissorhands and oh, wow like, God. and like horror movies like they got just they got sucked up but it's like uh what's his face from loki season uh, season one just comes up and just swallows it all 
It's a fucking rite of passage when you turn 13 that you enter this void. How you come out on the other side, we don't know exactly. Well, you go through the circle-shaped window. Yes, obviously. right. But they had stuff in there, uh, and Cheech and Chong is, is in that mix, too. Yeah. Uh, but, um, you know, I, at that point, I had seen it with friends in high school and then, you know, fell in love with it. It's great. And then, of course, McFarlane Toys had put out the Eric Draven uh, figure and the 12-inch figure and the fish tank, and I had all that stuff, too. Um, so, so yeah, that's kind of like my, my backstory with the crow. I did dress up as him for Halloween one year. I'm not surprised to hear that. I was thinking that. Just that memory just triggered. I, yeah, I got face paint all over my dad's big old trench coat. He was pissed. Oh man. (laughs) Do you have a picture of it? If you can get a picture of it, get it to me so I can put it in this episode. No, of course, no, of course not. Yeah, there wouldn't be pictures of that, but yeah. So everybody picture that right now. Sixth grade Connor, trench coat, white face, he's got the black paint, (laughs) full Jared Leto, right? (laughs) <laughs> but I did myself, so guarantee it looked like shit. It's all right. We'll Photoshop a picture of you. Hey, we'll call yeah. it a day. I probably look closer to this new idiot than I do the than I did uh, Brandon. So, so yeah. With that being said, uh, yeah, the, the movie was fantastic. But like like Sean had alluded to, and you yourself, uh, you know, James R. Obar's The Crow was a comic book. Mm. Uh, before any, if anybody doesn't know that, obviously, um, it's kind of common knowledge, but I did want to discuss it a little bit because it does tie in heavily to remake, the 94 remake, um, because... I, it's, not, not to cut you off, but I guess if you only saw the new one, you wouldn't know that, but outside of that no. specific killer context. When The Crow came out in 94, I think I think people were surprised because it was a comic book right. that they enjoyed and they saw it. Um, and they discussed it a little bit in the documentary about... Um, We'll get to it in a second, but they discuss it a little bit. That even the 90s nerds were insufferable. The comic was better! Like, right, <laughs> that's what it was. It was, It was. oh, the comic book was so much better, but that was pretty good, I guess. Just read the book. Yeah. So, uh, now, have you guys read the comic? Uh, I downloaded it, mm-hmm, uh, acquired it, um, f- uh, for this episode, uh, episode specifically, uh, and didn't have time to, like, take the whole thing to my face, but I read most of it, um... It's awesome, and like the art style was was pretty unexpected when you like associate the most like like the visage of that character with Brandon Lee because it's totally different on the page. He looks like a glam rocker. It's really striking. Yeah, he looks like Sammy fucking Kerr a little bit. Yeah, and Sting made a baby because <laughs> he's like jacked in some scenes. And he's, and he's got like, yeah, he's, he's doing got... like he's doing like anime JoJo poses. He's like <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, and the art goes from like. How would I put this? Uh, it kind of looks like the dude who does the Max, kind of a little bit, mixed yes. with like a like a, a, a Eastman and Laird kind of look, hmm. and then yes. it has like almost like fully rendered painting type artwork, which is interesting. Uh, that makes me think like Battle Angel Alita it, back in the day. It was kind of it's kind of cool. There's some it, it's it's pretty neat. What 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 I gleaned the most from it though was how much dialogue not only for the, for the original. F- film was pulled from the comic book which i was pretty surprised at in situations but um how much they use for the this remake right here oh yeah i love how they show that if you watch james obar's the crow for any reason and then read the comic your first impression of eric might be like this guy's a really talkative dramatic boy and then read the comic go like oh man he talks a lot like (laughs) Yes, he does. I was surprised. Everything's a metaphor or an allegory or a poem or something super dramatic. It's kind of entertaining at times. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's the whole thing. It's very like I'm glad they tone that back a little bit for the Brandon Lee movie because it's he wants everyone to know that he is sad and he is pissed. Dude, it is angsty, gloomy, goth teen through and through. And I think that's why it resonates, obviously, with with so many young kids in that in that arena. If you go by what James Obar has said, like since writing this, he says he wrote it all and put it all on paper so that he could get over this awful tragedy that happened to him his uh fiance died when they were both 18 oh my god she was killed by a drunk driver i think yeah and he said like oh this you know this will be cathartic it'll work and he said no it just made it more focused and when you read it and look at it you go "Ooh, you're going through it like (laughs) yeah yeah but that's such that's such a that's such a thing like it's almost a cliche where we hear like oh i i'm doing this piece of art to to work through these problems or whatever and i don't think we ever really hear about how it doesn't really work (laughs) to do that (laughs) no sometimes it makes it worse it makes it worse and in this case it did for him so i mean uh and we could probably use this as a soft jumping point but for him uh apparently as he was just starting to like kind of like finally heal up from that 
he was getting close to Brandon, and then he loses Brandon, and he said he went through the whole thing over again. Didn't know that. Ugh. So it was, yeah, he, like, he said, like, I guess, like, making the movie was somehow, like, therapeutic, and then Brandon died, and he was like... And I think that's, like, yeah. affected his stance on, like, continuing the franchise. I, I'm pretty sure he's been like, why don't you just stop? <laughs> I kind of agree. I got news for you, baby. We're making that fucking crow money. Well, I saw they were making comics even up to, like, at least the early 2000s. So I don't know if he was still involved at that point or if he had sold it. But, geez, I highly doubt it. Is that true? I, I will say that as I progressed through this franchise and I kept seeing, based on the novel by James O'Barr, I'm like, God, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, he's still getting a paycheck, that's for sure. I'm glad he's getting paid, but, like, you're stretching the meaning of that phrase. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just, like, um, the crow, and that's that's where it stops and ends. Yep. That's, like, when you get to, like, Alien Alien Covenant, and they keep saying, like, based on characters created by Dan <laughs> O'Banion, and you're like, are they really? Are they? Uh, <laughs> and designs by H.R. Giger. Yeah. Yeah, right, and yeah. That's it. Um, yeah, so with that being said, uh, yeah, I just want to talk a little about the comic and stuff because uh, uh, we can dovetail right into uh, Inertia, remaking The Crow. Now, I wanted to start this by what The Crow meant to us um, growing up and, and how Ed Connor has a, a very uh, big affinity for it. But that's why, uh, yeah, David Ullman and Matt Jackson uh, made their remake. They love the movie so much that it inspired them to kind of do their own thing. They were like independent filmmakers. Um, they were friends. They made a lot of like home movies and stuff together. And it reminded a lot, uh, rem reminded me a lot of like us, like growing oh, yeah, up yeah. and like making- they started when they're like 14 or 15. They were wow. I had, I, I made the joke to myself as I'm watching. I'm like, I didn't know I was watching something about Joe and Sean. Yeah, 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 right, yeah. But, like, it, it, it really resonated with me, the documentary, because, like... Or I would imagine anyone that has been in their, their, those same shoes doing sure. some short films with friends and family. Yeah, I'm, I if you feel yeah. like if you're if you're in this space, like, culturally, I feel like you, you must know one or two people like this who are into a thing so much that they have poured years of it, like, and they've made it into a craft, and, like, they do real fucking work, as you can see in this thing. And, like, just watch me outside go, like, you guys are really suffering, but you're kicking so much ass. <laughs> like, <laughs> And that's what, I, well, that's what I appreciated about yeah. it, because it was, like, it really gives you insight. Like, this isn't just, like, an independent film. This is, like, what we were doing when we were the same age and, oh, like, yeah. making shit. They were 14. They're 14 and 15, like, 14, 15 years old when they started this. So they started this in 1994. And they even say straight up in the documentary, like, yeah, originally, like, I'm not quoting it verbatim, but it's like, yeah, we did this as, like, something to do after school, hang out with some friends, we'll make a movie, we love The Crow, we love the comic, and then it's just like, as the years went on, this just turned into a bigger and bigger thing that was more serious, it wasn't just something to throw together, it was like, no, we actually are trying to make a good movie now, maybe yeah. that's not what it started as, but now it is. It took 12 years to make that fucking boyhood movie, or the fuck, and it took these guys who had nothing, absolutely nothing. Nothing for four years to make this thing. That's real work. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, though. But that's what's so great about it, because like they start this when they're 14 or 15 in 1994 and they finish this movie in 1998 when they're like 18 or like, graduating high school or what have you. And the idea of them just being like, oh, man, this comic book fucking rules. Oh, man, I we, you know, we just saw The Crow, which we probably weren't supposed to be able to see because it's rated R, so <laughs> right. let's go try to, like, redo this. But, like, let's not make it a shot-for-shot shot remake. Let's, like, do it from the comic because at the time, that's what they had heard from some people, like, in school and stuff, like, oh, man, you got to read the comic book or, like, it's something like the comic because, like, these are kids growing up in real time with the comic book and right. the movie coming out. Uh, which is pretty interesting. So that's what they do. They literally use the fucking comic book as a script to shoot their crow, quote unquote, remake. James O'Barr's The Crow. They basically almost use it as a storyboard on yeah. some level. Yeah. At times, it is one to one, like barring like limitations on budget and resources and like set design. Like they pulled the like the most basic form of lots of sequences from the page just directly onto the screen. Like, the ending, I think, is identical. There are shots of the BTS, because the, uh, 
smartly, one of them filmed everything behind the scenes. So that's how we kind of have the documentary about it as well. But there are like scenes of them like all hanging out and they literally all have an issue of the comic and they're all yeah. reading the comic, reciting the lines, like memorizing the lines <laughs> for the scenes. I, I thought that was that. just, it was so fucking endearing. Like I loved it so much. And there's something to be said about like, uh, you know, just because I love that idea of just taking the comic or the original like storyboard that someone came up with and like, Literally translating that one to one. Yeah. But I do also understand on some level creative uh, differences. People want to just do something different. So it isn't a literal one to one. Uh, but I don't know. Sometimes just someone did it right the first time. Uh, let's just copy that. They already figured it out. Let's not try to reinvent the fucking wheel. So I appreciate that is what I'm saying. Sure. Zack Snyder used Watchmen comic books for uh, comic pages for his storyboards just directly. Which is probably why I love that movie so much. Yeah. Also, the style of that movie too yeah. is is why that movie works a lot for me personally. It looks really good too. And no one's ever gonna be able to do it again. <laughs> nope. No. All right. Don't even try. <laughs> Where's the squid? I want the fucking squid. No. The squid stays home. <laughs> That's a whole episode in and of itself. <laughs> uh, just to get back to these kids though, like there was they had no money, zero. You used, they used what was around the house, what they had at their disposal. And that was another thing too. Like, I remember like when we were making shit uh, in high school. Oh yeah. And like, I would go into the garage and like go through my dad's shit and his tools and his scrap wood or whatever and like make stuff. I made a state, remember when I made a stabilizer out of like pipe oh, yeah. and wood? Oh yeah. Like, like with uh, what are the, the, the PVC pipes and shit. Well, yeah. A dolly we made too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, one of my favorite moments from this is like right in the beginning where someone's just like, so today uh, we're going to dig a hole and then we're going to bury my friend and then we're going to film him getting out of the hole. And that's it. <laughs> just super just down to earth shit. Like, yeah. Well, David's like he's in he's the guy who's in makeup and he like plays uh, uh, Eric Draven. Yeah. And he's like, I got a snorkel. I'm going to see if I can get <laughs> out of this hole. I hope I don't die. I'm not really going to be able to breathe. Yeah. And, like, they dug a hole in their fucking parents' backyard, and they filmed him crawling out of it. And, like, that's, like, the shit we did, you know? They did exactly what that guy said. He's like, we're going to put my friend in a hole, we're going to fucking bury him in a hole, and then he's going to come out of the hole. <laughs> They're, like, in the attic just grabbing random pieces of wood that definitely aren't important. Like, not building, like, a set piece and then putting dirt on that. Yeah, yeah. It's just, nope, you're going in the ground, we're going to bury it, just can't crawl out of it. They threw their friend in the earth and then put a cross over him, <laughs> like... Again, what did I say earlier? WCW Sting. Yeah. You know, the dumb Monday Night Wars were going on at the time. Buried Alive matches were popular. <laughs> Another one of the parts, too, they're like, they didn't have money for, like, lumber or wood or anything to, like, build the fucking bar. So they literally go up st up into his attic. Oh, that's what I was saying, yeah. And Extra wood lying around. It's not extra wood. They're taking the floorboards. Well, that's what I mean. You know how like like oh that are like over the stringers so you can walk around up in an attic so you don't fall through the ceiling. They're taking the fucking. Sh Everyone has a friend whose attic is completely unusable. It's like yeah, don't go up. Just walk on the beams. There's no floor. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm saying though. Like they're just grabbing random wood that's not important. It's like dad goes up there to grab something. He's falling through the fucking ceiling. So they're working like Clark, Clark Griswold. Yeah, well, right. Yeah. He walk. He walks to the back and they're just like pulling planks up and like cutting them up for like a bar top and shit. I just thought that was so. It was. It just made me feel really good. Good and like, uh, imagine going... they grab the formaldehyde. Oh, look, a nice fur coat. <laughs> well, then, like, they show you, they show you that basement they're gonna film stuff, and they show you like the first thing you see is it's wall to wall with like completely unidentifiable junk. Like, it's just a massive. It's stuff. Sean's garage. Sean's parents' <laughs> oh, garage. God. Yeah, my parents' little garage. Oh my god. Like a single path, and then the next shot is it's all in a line on the sidewalk, just waiting to be picked up by the trash. Like they they emptied the whole fucking thing out. That literally is my parents' garage. My parents they used to let it get a little uh, overflowing, <laughs> if you will. Uh, so we Joe actually helped a couple times so we could use the space uh, over over the many years of knowing him. But me, and my brothers, I've been in that fucking. I mean, my parents haven't lived in the house in a decade now, but there was many years <laughs> in the goddamn garage throwing shit to the side of the curb. <laughs> like, why are we why, why are we saving this broken bench? But that was anyway. so, but that was so great too cuz they went through everything like Connor said put it all put all the junk to the to right, the yeah. road and now they had this studio essentially to work in because now it's like oh we can make it grungy and grimy because it's like a it's like a cinder block garage you know and what I mean keep some of the garbage it's a mausoleum <laughs> it's a mausoleum done right and they had that the other guy's basement that they used and turned into like the uh the pawn shop and stuff which right I with some of the really garbage cool. they yeah. said it yeah exactly it's, it was it's it's 
it's really fucking great. <laughs> but so, they take dad's microwave from the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> they have a shot. Dad comes down. He looks all pissed like, what's going on down here? <laughs> Make how it many, a movie, dad. How many times were we in my basement? My dad come down like, what the fuck are you doing down well, here? I, my, my mom always- Make it a movie, dad. My mom always hated like, she didn't mind if we were doing it, but it's like, it depended on like what part of the house, like, which to be fair, like- We were always in your basement though. Yeah, but like, there we was, did this, this there's a couple stuff. times we did shit like in the living room and my parents were like, well, you know, we would have like cleaned up if we knew you oh, were gonna yeah. do that. And then my mom's like, is my, is my kitchen, is my, is my dirty kitchen on video? I'm like, uh, I don't know, ma, no, 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 no. No, we're good. We're not eating pizza and filming uh, it no. in your dirty Literally kitchen. a reference to something we did. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, uh, it, it's cool how you, like, like what you guys are saying, just mm -hmm. using Shit you had, yeah. maybe hitting up the Dollar Tree, we were broke. or Dollar we, Store, or we what didn't have, have you. We have a fucking, we, I mean, we had- The dump, maybe. Some of us had jobs, but none of us were making money to, like, fucking pay for you're, anything you're, to, they're to make They're 14, shit. what are they, got a lemonade stand, they got a paper route? No, but that's my point. So they they just, good old-fashioned ingenuity, and um and just, like, creativity, and getting together and doing all these things. Um, So, so around 1995, I think they shoot for, like, a year. Yeah. And they're getting like their friends together, and it's not professional actors or anything. It's just like favors, and they're and they're shooting all this stuff. Um, but they stop uh, because they're just like, we can't do this anymore. It's getting ridiculous. And then they come back, I think, in like 1996, and then start shooting again to finish the piece. And they end up finishing the the film. Right, quote unquote, and then I believe David starts editing it, and he's on like on a VH on a camera to his fucking uh you know VHS player, nightmarish. Yeah, oh I'm like, how? I don't even know how the fuck I would even do that, or like, how could you even make something good out of that? I wanted to add like everything we're describing. Like, there's a certain tone set by this documentary where it's just like there's no there's no pre production gloss. There's no glitz there's no magic it's just a bunch of real dudes just having it out sometimes and just giving out about how fucking hard this was and it's so raw and so real i love it they're like yeah. yelling at each other a couple times yeah they're like i invited 35 fucking people to show up and only one of them fucking did like oh god been well, there they, they wanted <laughs> oh my god how many times multiple times but like that was like the whole ending of the film because okay so they they come back in 99 1996 to, to refilm some stuff but then as they get older they're like hey i really we really want to like fix a couple things and like make this a final film and, like be, to be proud of right put some more of the, the dialogue that we cut because we were 14 and we oh we can't curse now we don't care because we're in high school yeah let's redo some of the dialogue do some of the racier scenes we were avoiding like the rape scene right because they weren't putting that stuff in because they're like we're going to show this to our parents and it's going to be fun we're going to hang right? out and like watch the stuff and they're like we hey. can't curse in it because we'll get in trouble and we can't put this rape thing in it because we'll get in trouble plug your ears grandma shut your eyes yeah. Can you imagine their dad being like so so uh What's this comic that you said you read that this movie is allegedly based on, huh? <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, go down that. Uh... I bought what for you for Christmas? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now you're just getting yourself in trouble. You're ratting on yourself. <laughs> How many times have we done that? Try to avoid those scenarios yeah, as a yeah, kid yeah. as much as, pass, as oh, possible. I did like how they did do that scene, just, just since we're talking about it. I mean, I brought it up. But well, like, it's all implied. Uh, which they do do in the original, mm -hmm. too. Uh, but I, I did like they do kind of show a clip of that in the documentary where they do a lot of fast cuts. And it's like, no, that's a good way to do it. Uh, you get the point across. You don't have to say it. They did it without doing it. Yeah, yeah right, right. Exactly. Just like the first one or the original, I should say, where it's like, I mean, it's a little bit more explicit in that movie, but it's more like the shot, the close-up shots of them yeah. on top of Shelley and Brandon Lee's reaction. It's actually similar. To a little how bit, they a do little it. bit. But like, it's uh, effective, is my point. Yeah, but I'm th there's a lot of stuff in this movie, in, in their remake, that I was like really surprised about. And there, I, I think my favorite thing about this whole documentary is like, you see the entirety of their coming of age. Mm. Within like the it. film and in the documentary. So it's like, oh, we're 14, 15. And then there's this journey. There's like an artistic journey. There's like a, a, a becoming a mature like adult. Um, and like this whole evolution, like as friends and as artists um, at making this film. And I think that makes it even kind of like more special. And like this weird kind of time capsule that was just put dumped onto the Internet because nobody could fucking sell it because it had the IP. Oh, well, right. You know? When they finally got it out there. What a cosmic miracle that someone was like, hey, let's just film the rest of this stuff, too. Um, because otherwise, like, who the fuck would know about this movie? And I, I, nobody. I, and like avid Crow fans have looked for 
the original movie, the full movie, which you can get on Lunch Meat VHS on YouTube for free. You can go check it out. Um, you know, they, they couldn't sell it, so they put it up online. And I think there was like bootleg uh, VHS copies like back then, like made too, um, because they couldn't legally sell right. it. Well, it's a fan film at the yeah. end of the day, so yeah. that always gets kind of wishy washy. Yeah. I mean, you make a good movie, make a good movie, but it's, yeah, it, legally it this gets is, hard. This is literally the stuff of that of that monster manias and and chiller theaters were made of the bootleg fucking weird movie that's on the table of like 9000 bootleg tapes and DVDs and shit this is one of those things that would be there you know what i mean where you could where you could grab it so I, it's just it's you just, tell someone about it, they have no fucking clue what you're talking about because yeah. you bought it for 20 bucks at chiller in yeah. this like <laughs> put together secondhand tape thing after your hand is kind of just glossed over 35 copies of video violence you land here on James O'Barr's The Crow. <laughs> right next to the other 32 copies of Bun Rocky that Rudy Reel's fucking trying to sell to you. I don't want them, Rudy. <laughs> you can you can have them. Keep yeah. them. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I, that's pretty much it. And uh, the, the documentary document, uh, well, obviously it's a documentary, <laughs> but like, it's just, it's just, it was just really endearing and, and I loved watching it and how these guys uh, kind of grew up together and this film kind of kept them together within this, you know, four year period of their lives and, and how it was like a big part of it and how much they didn't want to keep fucking doing it sometimes. It really, especially it, the one director basically was like, yeah, I, I essentially dropped out of it after the second year. Like I still was like working on it, but it wasn't full time for me. Like the passion wasn't kind of there. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing about about filmmaking i think i think it's like it's like at its core it's this like you said before this raw kind of unfiltered thing of like this is what it takes to make a fucking movie and sometimes you're not gonna want to make the movie that you've been wanting to that you're that you're actually making you know what i mean you're gonna be like this sucks today is today is work we have to get through it and we have to finish it it's not all like this is great we're doing all this stuff which is not everything can be a part in your mouth, Joe. Which, which, which is a testament to saying, like, people that want to make films really do need to be passionate about what they're doing yeah. to follow through and create it. It's a, it's a lot more than just, I don't have the money or I don't have the time. It's, it's, it's making the time. It's making the sacrifices. It's, it's doing all of those things to, to, to realize your vision and, and, and have an entire piece put together. Every finished movie is a fucking miracle. It's a miracle. Oh, well, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, like the amount of work that goes in is fucking crazy. What's topical, I think, is that everybody, now more so than ever, I feel like people think it's easy to make a film. Uh, because we have so much stuff available to us to make one. Um, but it's not easy. No, it's not not only is it not easy to make a film, it's not easy to make a good film. And like the whole time when you're watching this documentary, you're like, man, you know, we should have fucking did this differently. We could have did this better. This came out like shit. We I wish I could have did X, Y, and Z. And like if those aren't the things you're thinking about, um, I think you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I just wanted to add too, I think yeah. just not that a lot of documentaries from that time period don't exist, but it's kind of cool to see one, especially like from a fan uh, perspective or someone that's more amateur, independent, uh, more independent, is an independent filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, putting this out or, or at least creating it back then in the late 90s is kind of cool. And like it makes me even think of like not a comparable thing because it's a very different movie, but American movie, uh, which is like a documentary right. of a movie yeah. they're trying to make it. It's just it's funny because the people that the, the real life people in that film are just funny characters. Yeah. Then watch it if you haven't seen it. But it made me think of like a, a truncated more like, hey, it's not jokey. They're actually talking about their film, but it like, had a similar vibe of like, oh, like you were saying earlier, like it feels like something that we could have made when we were younger or one of your friends or your, like, I mean, not that we are filmmakers, but I'm saying people that you know, like maybe you guys at home, you maybe you're a filmmaker. Yeah. So when you know that does film or, or an art medium that's similar, it's, uh, you know, those people. I guess is where I'm going with that, that whole slobbering mess I just said. <laughs> no, no, it, that made, uh, that it's made cool. Sense, I don't know. Yeah. It was cool to see that. I, it kind of, if I didn't already say it, Joe, I think kind of said it, but it did touch home a little bit. Yeah. Sometimes these uh, documentaries don't always land for me uh, on film, and I love films. You would think they all would land for me, <laughs> but it's just uh, the way it was put together was very professional. I wasn't expecting it. It's very professional, but also, like, it feels very stream of conscious, and, like, it doesn't really have a format or a flow. They It just rolls, and then you're done. And you're like, oh, that was brief and brisk and awesome. Like, not a chore at all. Th yeah, no, not at all. Um, And, like, it's... They cover four years of their life in like 60 minutes. 
it's just great. I really, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was, and, and of all things to kind of springboard off of, it was The Crow. You right. know what I mean? And then they became dedicated to remaking it or or an ad- or adapting the comic book as a faithful thing, um, which is pretty amb- it's pretty ambitious. They even say it in the, the the documentary, they're like, if we know what the fuck we if we knew as kids what we knew as adults, we wouldn't even fucking tried to do yes. it. Yeah. And I think I think I think uh, we lose a lot of that as we get older. And this is a prime example of that because all it takes sometimes is to get off up your fucking ass and just do it. You know what I Pull mean? Pull the just, trigger. Just jump in with both feet. You know, uh, and I, I thought wow. that was, it's very inspiring. I guess is, is is my point. Maybe I shouldn't use that analogy in this instance. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Sorry, didn't I let that was a legit slip of the tongue. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. Um, do you guys have any other thoughts about the the documentary or or James O. Barr's The Crow from 1994? The the actual uh, remake of The Crow, James O. Barr's The Crow. I'm really impressed with um, like how much good stuff they were make purely through limitation like they didn't have anything and yet somehow all that hard work just bubbles through like most of the time and you can tell everybody involved or at least all the people who are like you know are really heavily involved like really give a shit and i think that can transcend like lack of budget like no resources anything because this movie's made of fucking camcorders and it looks like it and it sounds like it but like at some point it just washes over and you're like this is so good i don't really give a shit and that's something that i want to say to like if anybody going into this to watch it Mm. understand that these are kids it's micro budget it's shot on video but all of the love and the passion comes through you know what I mean? And there are some, I mean, you got to look past the acting. You got to be like, okay, these are kids. They're not the greatest of actors. They're not, you know, the greatest of cinematographers. But there's a lot to love and there's a lot to appreciate. Um, in, in Especially, it's, it's a fucking full-fledged movie. Like, it's it's a honest-to-goodness feature film. I, I mean, I only skimmed it to be perfectly honest, uh, but it is on YouTube. Maybe I'll go back and watch it after... Uh... After doing this was maybe a little ass backwards, but uh, I will say this. Maybe this is where we're going with this conversation. Okay. It seems like these guys cared a lot more about this uh, movie or the crow uh, uh, as a property Mm -hmm. than maybe some of the sequels did. You beat me to it. (laughs) Uh, Just purely. I haven't seen all the sequels. I did see the remake. But at least the remake, uh, at least I could say that much about that film. These guys gave, cared way fucking more about The Crow. That is an absolute banger uh, segue. Okay. So why don't we... Okay, so we all love this. If you... Oh, uh, check yeah, it out. Yeah, I thought it was great. Check Go go to um, Lunch Meet VHS on YouTube, um, and you can watch the entirety of James O'Barr's The Crow. And right now, over on LunchMeetVHS.com, you can pick up the VHS of Inertia, remaking The Crow on tape. Um, it's well worth it, um, and it's a lot of fun to watch. And if you're a filmmaker or aspiring filmmaker or used to do it as kids or just wanted a glimpse into this wonderful time capsule, definitely check it out. It's a really it's a really great watch. Uh, But with that being said, let's talk a little bit about uh, the sequels to the original Crow movie. What else you got? You got some video game shit. You want to see you? The C- <laughs> the Crow Cinematic Universe, the Crow of course. Cinematic Universe, yeah, maybe. We got TV, we got video games, we got direct to platform uh, slop, and we have a big budget turd. We have everything. Um, well, thank you, Mister Draven. Uh, oh my God, thank you, Studio System. <laughs> um, uh, I noticed, I noticed as I was going through this, the studios kept changing. I was like, hmm, I wonder why that is. Oh, from movie to movie, yeah, um, yeah. I think like Miramax did City of the Angels, Dimension did uh, Salvation. Honestly, when I put Wicked Prayer on, like I felt my brain kind of just slipping out of my ear, so I think I missed that one. Um, and I, Lionsgate did the new one, I believe. Dimension did put out the original Crow. They did. I thought it was Miramax. I oh, think it was Miramax. Oh, it was Miramax, but Dimension definitely put out that that DVD. I remember that double disc collector's edition. Yeah. Yeah. So I uh, I said before we started recording that I took this whole franchise to the chin. Like I've never taken a franchise before. I watched everything. I watched a playthrough of the PlayStation One game. It's really bad. It's really, really bad. I was going to say, how does it hold up? Connor bared the cross for us all. Oh, my God. <laughs> he wore he wore the circle window on his back. <laughs> it's got, like, this, like, really stiff, tiny Ash Corvo. I think it's his name, Ash Corvo. Yeah, model. And he just kind of walks around these barren, barren, gigantic pre-rendered backgrounds and will punch maybe one thug or two and then move on to the next screen and do that for two hours and the game is over. What do you, what do you, what do you do? 
He just explained it. You just you you find an area, you punch a person, you walk to the next area, you punch the next person. There's no story. Like they drop in like like uh really bad like uh like recreations of scenes from the movie, but in PlayStation One pre rendered CGI cutscenes. So everyone's just like an angry rectangle. Um, oh my god. Well, you'll be seeing footage of it if you're watching oh the YouTube God. version. This is like tofu from Resident Evil. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Crow 2 actually is a movie that I kind of like because I said before, I saw it before I saw the first one. Uh, it doesn't leave the same impression, but when I watched it again with uh, grown-up you know, eyes, uh, it's two-thirds pretty good and then one-third fucking lousy. Um, and that one-third is mostly the ending and um, the fact that like, at times, it doesn't seem like they're confident enough to do something that's entirely different because they're just kind of repeating beats from the first movie. Um, they even just lift entire musical cues, um, like that big, like that big emotional swell that you hear, and even in the uh, James O'Barr's The Crow, that's in this too. I really like Vincent Perez as the main character. He's got this really manic, angry wrathful performance whereas brandon's got this underlying tone of sadness vincent perez is like doing magic tricks in people's faces and just like <laughs> you said <laughs> you sent me a clip where he kills somebody i'm like this is like hispanic goth zorro yeah he's got this thick spanish accent it's awesome yeah okay it, it, it's pretty awesome that scene has my favorite part in the movie in terms of just unhinged bullshit because he blows this guy up in this like big drug uh like they're producing drugs he blows the building up and he walks out the moment he steps out the door as the explosion goes behind him i'm your boogeyman by rob zombie starts playing and then the crow flies over <laughs> palm trees and as the crow passes over the palm trees the palm trees explode i don't know why but <laughs> Bug man, I'm it's a the bug funniest man. fucking Power thing. Rob Zombie. Um, <laughs> Power Iggy, of the zombie. Iggy Pop is in it, and he's doing his fucking best to be a completely unhinged wacko. He's my favorite performance in the movie. Uh, he has my other favorite instance of cussing in this whole franchise, where he turns and looks at Ash and goes, Fuck you, bird dick! And then hops on his motorcycle <laughs> and drives away. And that's All his right. big <laughs> machismo moment. That's how you get Iggy Pop in there. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta go back and see that one. The one connective tissue from City of Angels that I kind of held on to in terms of it being the same location was that the other main character is a grown-up version of Sarah from the first movie. Oh, and she lives in what appears to be. <laughs> um, <laughs> Why? <laughs> I mean, that actually would make kind of some sense, but I mean. It doesn't make sense. It is the only reason that you can get away with the face paint. It is the only reason you can get away with the tonal similarities and all that kind of stuff. Because Does she uh, put it on? Yes. He she okay. envisions his resurrection and meets him at the very moment when he comes back. And that I she has Eric's mask in her apartment. So she knows that she understands it was Eric and understands the same thing is happening. So it kind of just gives him the same gift that, you know, that she has from that memory. And does it with, um, so in this one, it's him and his son are killed, and she paints his face with his son's acrylic paint, so it's also, it's a personal connection to him, too. It's one of my favorite things about it. Um, the villain sucks, he's real bad, his name's Judah, and he does this whole, like, she becomes the Shadow Crow, uh, and then, uh, he beats the fucking brakes off of Ash at the end of the movie, he gets no offense in, and then Ash kills him by summoning an army of crows with his jacket, and they eat him. Like Willow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like Willard, you mean? I did it again. You God fu damn it! You, you fucking said Willard. <laughs> I fucking Willard. sat here and thought about it. I was like, "Don't say the wrong name, Don't. Willard." Yeah. <laughs> we did a book to the, the movie rats. episode yeah. about uh, of unknown origin. If you mm. want to know what the hell I'm talking about, check that video. Well, out. people know what Willard is, but I think the ending also was fucked with the studio. But I can't. I don't know if I remembered that wrong. But um, yeah, the third one is uh, Salvation, and that's got Eric Mabius as our main character, who's Alex Corvus, and then it's got Kirsten Dunst. William Atherton, Walton Goggins, and Fred Ward. Let me tell you something when I tell when I tell you I don't fucking remember that one. I thought Salvation was the furlong one. Fred Ward. No. Yeah, Salvation's weird because um they they dispense with the face paint entirely. But the but oh, like kiss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when they did lick it up, yeah. sure. Wait, isn't there a, a picture of him with the makeup on though from from Salvation? So what it is is that he so he gets he's wrongly convicted for killing his girlfriend. He gets the electric chair. They kill him. But when they kill him, they want to make sure that he's extra dead. I guess for some reason, or they just want to be dicks. And they put this big giant like metal Texas Chainsaw Massacre looking death helmet over him as they electrocute him, and it's it burns his face. 
And so when he resurrects, he peels all the burned flesh off, and the mask has left these deep scars in his face, and he's just pale from being dead, so that's the entire appearance. Gotcha, it's like a Lord of Illusions. It has a hilariously 2000s soundtrack, um, stabbing westward more Rob Zombie. Um, are, are we butt are we butt rocking all the way to fucking Crow Town? We it, like, there's there is the funniest needle drop. Where's the Static X? There, oh my God, there is. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> ah, a, they, there we go. They're, they're Wayne's cover getting of, his check. You're right in the pocket co- there. Their cover of Burning Inside by Ministry pops up as a transitional <laughs> track. Um, Wait a second, Static X covering Ministry? <laughs> is that what you said? In a Crow sequel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy Lord. shit! That's like Inception. That's like layers, man. Onions. Oh my god. So many edges. Um, there's a, as he's, and so he resurrects in prison and he escapes prison and there's a needle drop as he escapes that's like some weird 2000, like, acid rap kind of thing where someone's like, word to your brother, I'm a bad motherfucker. I'm like, why is this in the oh movie? Oh boy. Ah. I'm on an island. <laughs> Oh, God, remember that? Oh, my God. Fucking way call back to the fucking Dark Forest episode. Oh, man. That was a bad independent film. It's not as bad as I thought it was going to be, um, because, like, by halfway through it, I was like, it's direct to fucking platform. It's not the worst thing I've ever seen. There's a really cool car chase that ends with a top-down shot of Air- Alex uh, driving a car with one of his, like, the people who killed him into a bus to kill him, and they do a super close-up shot of the two of them flying out the windshield, hitting the bus face first, and, like, no transition. They just eat shit. It looks awesome. Oh, hmm. that's pretty cool. Do their eyes pop out like a Mad Max movie? (laughs) I wish they did now. Um, But, yeah, it looks fantastic, all practical. Um, uh, But, yeah, not bad. I don't remember that one, like, at all, so I I really do want to go back and, like, watch the other Crow movies, and, like, did you watch the Edward Furlong one, The Wicked Prayer? Well, I was going to say, everything positive I had to say about the first two is now going to stop. Okay, so you did see this. Yes, yes, I watched it again. Okay, okay, because I I wanted to be, like, I wanted, I was hoping that we could go back and be like, you know what, Ed, you were fine as the Crow, but I don't think that's, okay, we're not going to do that. He has been fine since he was John Connery, Joe. (laughs) So, a funny thing happened as I went on this journey with these movies. Um, I was fully prepared for Wicked Prayer to be the one that I just had to shit on the most. And I had this whole bit prepared about how, like, a long time ago, Mr. Lobo in the episode we do them kind of instilled this thing, like, maybe I should have a more positive approach to when I watch movies. And I was like, maybe I'll come out of this the other side. And fully expected to be like, nah, it's a piece of shit. Um, it's fucking irredeemable. <laughs> it's, like, it's just misunderstood. Yeah. Um, oh, right, Lobo saying, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then I started to hear about the other fucking Crow remake that was coming out. And I was like, oh no, we might have a contender for the title. Um, but Wicked Prayer is still pretty fucking bad. Um, it's directed, D- directed DVD slop. Oh, okay, can you walk us through just a little bit of that? Yeah, just a, just a little bit of that, because I am curious. I'm going to go back and watch it, but I want to know. I'm not. So it's... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'm good on Edward Furlong's bullshit. That was so concrete, like, oh, no, Sean, we'll never see that movie. Um, I, I was mean, hoping I, so bad, I was like, please, let let the Edward Furlong one be the one that everybody's like, you know what, that one is actually pretty yeah. good. I don't say never, Connor, but it is so low on the fucking <laughs> list. It might be when I'm 90. It is the funniest, by far. Um, It's a hyper-edgy Romeo and Juliet story about uh Edward Furlong, who's just, I don't know, a bum, I guess? The movie doesn't really tell you much about him. Um, who wears a, a suit at some point that looks like he's been like big cursed, like he looks like a kid in a fucking like like a, a grown up suit. He's like a Talking Heads video. Got it. Uh, he apparently is dating a girl who lives on an Indian reservation, and his I think his brother is uh, David Boreanaz, uh, who's a, a weird psycho girlfriend. Valentine himself. Ho- I'll hold on. Uh, whose uh, other cohort is Tara Reid. Um, lining him up, baby. Danny Trejo is also in this movie. Oh, lining oh, him Danny, up. Danny, he's in everything. Oh, yeah. I- icing on the cake is Danny Trejo. Uh, and the p- premise is that uh, Edward Furlong is dating this girl who's from the Indian Reservation. Uh, there's some kind of subplot with uh, miners and a, a casino opening up. It's not important. Um, but <laughs> David Boreanaz <laughs> plays Edward Furlong's brother who, es- who escapes from prison and then murders Edward Furlong and his native girlfriend because he doesn't want them mixing uh, bloodlines, I guess, because he's just racist. Oh, my goodness. And then also there's a weird occult ritual where Tara Reid cuts this poor woman's eyes out. Oh, God. Well, they, but oh, that's from we... the original. 
Yeah, we're bringing that back from the first one. David Boreanaz has a gaggle of henchmen who all have names like the Riders of the Apocalypse. One of them is Tito Ortiz, the UFC fighter. Um, and David Boreanaz's introduction just has a still shot with a red filter over him. And it says, death, occupation, blah, blah, blah. And gives like video game stats or whatever the fuck. And does that for all of his henchmen. Do you remember we were doing that a lot then? I mean, we did it for one of our videos that we made. Oh, well, that was at the time. At, sure. In 2000 and, you know, two or wherever oh that came God. out. Everyone says really dumb, edgy stuff all the time. And I know we just said Draven is really you know, sappy and dramatic in the original stuff, but this is like, they'll say something and then double down with edginess the very next line, and every one of them is worse than the one that preceded it. Um, the acting's bad, the lighting is bad, the makeup is bad, uh, the story is bad, the writing is bad. It has really no irredeemable qualities, and still somehow is not the worst movie in the whole franchise. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my question, though. Does Edward Furlong put the makeup on? He does. He takes two little lines and goes, Meep, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> like little giants. But Why? I don't know. I don't remember. <laughs> it just, it kind of just, I was like, all right, this doesn't do anything for me. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't blame you. All right. So with that being said, did you watch the the, the, the Mark Dacascos, uh TV show? Oh, I forgot he did one, right? I have glim. I actually watched that when it was on TV when I could catch it. So it was, I think it was like the same time period as like Xena and Hercules and like that kind of time period. And it's a weird retelling of the first movie over a season of television. That's pretty interesting because, like, I totally forgot about that. And I was like, huh, if you were going to do a Chrome, why was it, first of all, why wasn't Mark Dacascos in he any- from again? That name sounds familiar. He's from Double, Double Dragon. Dragon, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. If he's not, I'm going to I'm gonna get that in one second. Because um, <laughs> I got to, you know, we got to drop some MDU shit. But, like, why wasn't he put in a Crow movie? I think that- oh, He would have been good. Like, he, uh, he's an obvious choice for me. This is it. You ready? Here's the crow. Here's the MDU crow movie with Mark DeCascos. <laughs> I was gonna say, is he looking at Alyssa Milano's well, ass well, in the makeup? No, he's killed by Kogashuko, and Alyssa Milano's killed by Kogashuko. Oh and the no! Last, the last thing that Mark DeCascos sees is her ass glistening in the moonlight. <laughs> he's eye raping her. That's how it goes down. Yeah, this is the most terrible thing that could have possibly happened in history. We're bringing you back. <laughs> the crow's well, bringing you back. Well, no, Kogashuko kills her. So okay. it's it's like this like it you kind of got like these samurai things running through it as well, right? And he becomes the crow. Double Dragon 2, write it. Double Dragon. Ship it. Double Dragon. No, no, it's not called Double Dragon. It's called The Crow. The Crow Double Dragon. Shadow Zone or some shit. Double I like Double Crow. <laughs> double Crow. <laughs> two times the crow, two times the ass. Two crows. <laughs> It's just two crows. It's just the crow, but like one of the letters is a I'm two. I'm speechless. I'm literally yeah. speechless. Um I remember that the the crow persona was like a whole separate thing that he would like turn into. So that he just wouldn't have the makeup on half the time. What? Is, like what is Power he, like, Rangers? He, like He-Man? There's an episode where Eric fights himself, but the version he's fighting is the makeup version. And I don't remember what episode that's from, but that memory is burned into my head. It sounds pretty interesting, actually. I wonder like how that stacks up, you know what I mean, against the other against the other films. You can buy the whole series, one season, in a box set somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> But but what's funny about that? It's like the Crow remake again. So like oh. we get the '94 one. We got the Crow remake, which is essentially the TV series. Yeah, yeah. Technically, we're we're on remake three. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in theory, we could do this joke again. Like if we wanted to cover that series, we could. Like, the other other remake. The other other Crow remake. Yeah. Uh, you were asking about Mark Dacascos though, and uh, eagle-eyed people will know he's in John Wick four. I think three. Um, he's a, one of the main villains in one of the John Wick movies, and I love the John Wick movies because they give people like Mark Dacascos and, uh, 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 I can't remember my favorite Belgian actor's name, the dude who's on the MST3K stuff, uh, Daniel Bernhardt, they give people like those guys, like, like working stunt and action actors, like good work. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that too, because the other connection there with, with the crow is that the guy who filled in for those spots in the first movie to get those extra shots is the director for the John Wick movies. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> he's the, yeah, he's the body double for, for Brandon Lee in those couple shots in the first movie. That's crazy. So it came, it just came full circle. Wow. <laughs> All right. The crow 2024 with Bill Skarsgård. Mm. I haven't seen it. Sean has gone to see it. He's going to talk a little bit about that, and and Connor has seen it. My first impression, I just want to say, get it out of the way, when I saw the trailer, that was a, a big fuck no for me when I saw it. I was like, no, no, thank you. It wasn't even the trailer. It was the first still they released. The whole universe went, oh, 
God. Oh, like, oh that too. <laughs> yeah, it was like it's like did we learn nothing from Suicide Squad? Yep. I don't understand like why the fuck would you make him look like First of all, Joker looks like shit, of course. But like, why would you make him look like that? Why would you make him look like fucking Post Malone or some Bro. shit? What is what? What is he this? He has above his eyebrow in fucking script font the word lullaby. He's got an Easter Island head tattoo on his nipple, where like his nipple is the eye or something. It's a bizarre tattoo choice. Um, but yeah, the design sucks. And like, uh, I think like I can't remember who said it, but someone's. I think it was actually. You, Joe, you're like, missed opportunity to not give him long hair. Like, what the fuck? Oh, God, I, he's got that bad, like, die Antwood haircut. Like, I feel like that would actually help. He's got, like, the bad mullet thing going on. But, like, when people were, like, when when he was announced that Bill was going to be the new Crow, people were doing, like, mock-ups of him with the long hair. And I was like, okay, sure. I mean, if you're going to do the remake, that, that's fine. I don't need it, but, like, sure. Yeah, and, like, he's not a bad... Sure, those people are pissed. Yeah, well... T- typically speaking, he's not a bad actor, but, like, he's phoning in, like, a motherfucker in this movie. And, like, we were talking about this earlier, like... I, you were saying maybe he doesn't have an accent, but like he sounded Swedish as fuck in this movie. Like he's losing that American accent, like every other line of dialogue. It's really noticeable I've towards like the him, back half of the movie. I've seen him in a lot of stuff. And he never does. That's crazy. And he never ha- he, I don't. Not he really I, didn't give a fuck. Not that I fuck. <laughs> not that I fucking noticed. Yeah. Uh, but I, I I like Bill Skarsgård a lot. Like I think he's a really good actor. Pennywise. One of the better parts of those two films. It might also be because he's half asleep in this movie and doesn't give a shit. Um, his performance is very sedated. Um, but yeah, you're. But my first impression of this was like, are we getting just like a hyper bloody, like big balls of the wall action movie that's just really angry and edgy and and you know, it's to turn your brain off and you know watch the violence unfold kind of thing. And honestly, if it was that, which is what it looks like, looked like from the trailer, yeah. Hey, guess what? It's it's none of that. It's that that what you see in the trailer is like everything that is in the movie, basically. That's all the action in the film. <laughs> so it's just like this what ten sec ten minutes. Yeah. Usually in the rice, we'll give like a spoiler warning, but I feel like at this point, like we're just gonna we'll talk about this kind of vaguely, but I mean, this movie's so fucking bad, I, I can't even recommend it, to be Sean, honest with you. Sean, this fucking movie is on streaming. I always, we kind of said that early, oh, right, two at days this point. From by the, now. It, it's already of this on, recording. Yeah, that's true, that's true. It, it, comes out, it comes out on streaming Friday the 13th, so we're already past this, this that. This is a movie where, okay, the original Crow, again, I didn't read the comic, but it's like the, the opening, they basically give you all the information you need. Crows do this. Shelly and, and uh, Eric are, are, are killed and tortured. He's coming back. He's coming out of the grave in the first five. This movie takes 45 fucking minutes before these people get murdered, and it is like the, the most generic murder I've ever seen in a fucking film. It has no teeth. It has no teeth. They're, they're not tortured. I mean, I'm not necessarily advocating for this, but that's the whole point of the crow. No, but it's the tragic. Right, they're not death tortured. Of them. Yeah, they also change the enemy in the original movie. It's like these punks or whatever, but in this, it's like some like weird corporate thing where like there's this guy played by um, Danny Houston who's in a lot of stuff. Thirty Days a Night, the main vampire, yeah. right? Doing a horrible Wilson Fisk impression. Uh, who who is also like a devil worshiper and has made a pact with with Lucifer where he now God. can live longer, but he also has the ability to do this to people <laughs> in their ear, and then they suddenly like their is eyes roll behind he, their head and they kill themselves with a knife. He's Gandalf. Yeah, but that this is the enemy. This is the literally yeah. this is the enemy in the movie uh, instead of just some punkers or tweakers. Yeah, uh, 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 Connor had told me this. About the devil's shit, and I'm like, excuse me? My thing is, in the first one, like, you don't really need to spend a lot of time with Eric and Shelley um, to understand how awful and mean and cruel and indifferent what has happened to them is, because you get just enough information to be like, I will walk through fire with Eric Draven to watch him rip these people apart for what they took from him. Because that's what it's about. It's it's not about revenge, because revenge is like a is a very uh, selfish uh, motivation. Like, Eric wants to make these people pay for an injustice that would otherwise not, it would go unpunished. Just to your point real quick uh, about how we, we get to know them so quick and how tragic it is, we also get to see the deepness of their love in such a small, in truncated pieces, but it hits so right. home, it hits the home. But they so do the Rob Zombie thing in this yeah. one where they spend little like 40 minutes of this is this character yeah. this is this other character they meet in the the suicide prevention group or the or the recovering teens that are addicted to pills or something top dollar in the first movie and his gang are terrestrial earth-based regular humans who are flexing the power they have on a city to cause harm to regular people 
and that is a real thing that can happen to basically anybody. It's RoboCop. Yeah, it's real shit. It can happen to you anytime. Like, and th- these two were just the victims of happenstance. But they're like, we gotta kick these people out of these building. If they don't leave, just fucking kill them. Um, uh, in this, it's like, goo goo boo boo the devil. Um, and it's too much, and I don't care. Like, they only get together because they're like escaping this facility, and then they are like, oh, you're hot. Oh, you're really hot. Oh, have you ever been in love, Joe? Have you ever been in love, Connor? Have you ever seriously, seriously been in love, Connor? Like, seriously. These people who just met love is so powerful that. It creates a revenant, okay? That's that's what this movie wants me to believe. <laughs> also, what I was saying is like no 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 horrible torturous death. They literally have a plastic bag overhead and asphyxiator. That's it. I mean, that's pretty horrible, and but she like dies. but like and he watches it. Where is the in his fuckboy jacket, th- th- by the way? That that's that's what I'm talking about. Like just just from you guys talking about this like in the first film, again, like I just said those little tiny glimpses of them like Having a shaving cream right, fight well. or like, you know, just hugging each other in bed or something like that. Like, I get all of what I need to about their relationship and how close they were and how much they were in love. You don't need a late on thing. I don't Joe. need people being like, do you know how much I love this woman? I'm going to tell you 60 fucking times. What is even worse about everything you're saying is that you are subjected to a long stretch of film where they just talk at each other baby talks they do drugs in a fucking bathtub um they like and like the thing about eric and shelly in the original one is that like they're broke regular ass people and these two pretty unlikable douchebags are living it up in some like super expensive looking hotel room that shelly has <laughs> really their, fr- their friend's apartment yeah friend's apartment um they're not very relatable they're not very likable um eric is i don't like to use like Lang- like he's a fucking weakling. Um, like he, he isn't st- like they show you he doesn't stand up for himself. He just lets people bully him and beat him up all the time. Well, because they do this whole thing where he like when he comes back as the crow, he does not really back as the crow. He's still himself, and he's he's afraid to hurt people. He's afraid to kill people. And there's like a long period after he's dead, which again is still forty minutes into the movie. There's another half hour. Where he's still like, I don't know if I could do this. Getting other people killed in the process by Ugh. being like, you know, hesitating essentially. And it's like, it's trying to create this drama, but again, which maybe where you were going with this, Connor, it just doesn't feel like the crow, because it's like, I say fuckboy, fuck, fuckboy's not even the right thing, it's like, he's a club goer, he's someone that's like, doing ecstasy, going to raves, and it's like, you just threw the whole, like, goth element, which is so critical and um, important to so many people about this character, and threw it out the fucking window. Well, your style is completely gone. Well, there is no style. Right, yeah, and he's wearing this goon jacket, which yeah. maybe I just don't get it, because I'm 36, yeah. uh, but I'm just like... He looks like a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> who is this f- right but I'm like who is this for like is this for like the 17 year olds or like this is this love was so real this movie's amazing like who is this for but that completely defeats the purpose of like what the crow is at its core it just it totally misses the mark you know and it's funny we keep mentioning we keep mentioning the titular crow hey guess how much that fucking animal has to do in this movie no- nothing it flies around a little there's like one scene where they just have him walk around to cure music and it's like pointless yeah the crow the, like the actual entity itself that's used like very specifically in the other movies as a guide and like points him to where he's supposed to go and like has narrative emphasis um and has like very important uh connections to his vulnerability blah blah, blah. the crow is just here to be yeah, like and yeah the, the symbiosis yeah instead you get some guy in i don't know what's that fucking train station from harry potter oh 93 quarters just standing there and he's like yo he's like He's like, you're the crow now, dog. And then he just pushes him back into the... (laughs) Oh, (laughs) yeah. That's their version of Limbo. (laughs) You're the crow now, dog. Fist bump. Yeah, because this is in Limbo, essentially. Love love the face tats, bruh. It's like it's like basically like where Voldemort's like fucking like uh, uh, fetus sack at the end of the last oh, movie is. Yeah. Not it's not all white, but it's like that like Connor said with like yeah. puddles and shit because they have this whole thing where he keeps getting pushed into puddles and he's he's in the water trying to save Shelly and he can't reach her like like uh, Frodo in the fucking lake. <laughs> yeah, because the whole thing is Shelly is Shelly is going to Shelly's soul is going to hell because Danny Houston's character made her commit a murder against her will. So yeah, he gets the power for in exchange for the soul. This sounds like some convoluted ass. Oh, they they tried to like it's really dumb. Too much, too much. Like they're trying to force like some Hellraiser, like weird devil Ugh. worshiper shit in there. Uh, and also just me and Connor were kind of joking about this earlier. Nothing against, not just make fun of somebody's name, but this is your stage name, so I'm gonna make fun of it. Formerly known as Twigs, really? Also, she's bad. She's really bad. She's just bad. Like. She- <laughs> 
no, there are there are people that can that can be singers and also oh, actors no, sure. too. I mean, I'm we've seen it a million busting times. Busting chops because I but, couldn't believe. No, but the... like I could not follow the fucking narrative you were guys were talking about because uh, I don't know who the fuck Twigs is or formerly known <laughs> as. I was like, what are you talking about? I mean, she's about? like an artist that's kind of known to be a yeah. little out there, to be fair, yeah. so maybe that's what she's going for, yeah. but she wasn't great in this at all, yeah. and and just kind of just to, I don't know how much more you wanted to say, Connor, but like the last like half hour, he finally goes full crow. I mean, he's indestructible this whole movie, but he's not officially the crow. No, but he is the crow the whole movie? You're the crow now, dog. Right. <laughs> You're like, the crow. I'm going to make that a fucking t-shirt <laughs> oh now. God. Every time he gets every time, crow now, dog. Every time he gets killed, he goes back to this train station. But when he becomes the official crow and the, the crow flies into his back and now the black blood comes out of his eyes, hold, hold then he the, could take five hundred shots to the chest and not hold die. The fucking phone. There is a The reversal of the original where he actually loses the ability and there's tension. This time he gains the ability and there's zero tension. Yeah, but he's not even connected to the crow in the new movie. Well, it flies into his back. What? He's, well, he's gonna <laughs> sacrifice himself. That's the thing, Joe. He's gonna sacrifice. If I, I could give my soul, like fucking Voltron? I'm gonna give my soul so Shelly can come back like Hercules, and then I'll just die. Is that? Can we do that? <laughs> well, okay, sure. Shake on it. That was flabbergastion that came directly from the soul. Um, uh, I was gonna say, <laughs> like, when you, especially when you compare the climaxes, like the original one, Eric beats Top Dollar, not with a big crane kick or something he gives him all because at that point eric's like all i've got left is like tenacity because his his, his invulnerability has gone um so he's putting up a good fight but then he's like nah i'm gonna give you 30 hours of pain that shelly endured in the last you know day of her life and you can have it all at once and he overloads this dude's brain and he just fucking boils essentially um and in this uh bill skarsgård just like punches danny houston in a puddle <laughs> oh he... bro he reversed oh, freddy oh, krueger's oh, match hold on hold on hold on how does he kill the devil he reversed <laughs> freddy krueger's him because the whole time the thing is the guy keeps talking in your ear so there's like this climax where he's like confronting him and the whole time he keeps walking slowly closer and closer to skarsgård i'm like oh he's gonna try to talk in his ear he does, but he like he reverse he reverse Freddy Krueger somebody grabs him and he pulls him into limbo into the train station where now he can be hurt. But he's the devil. But then he gets pushed into the lake and again where Frodo fell because all these fucking arms grab him. But he's the devil. He's not the devil. He has a contract with the devil. Yeah, he's a human man who has a contract with the devil. So every time someone commits suicide under his supernatural. Uh, direction, their soul goes to Satan, and he attains, he gains power. But he, but he also somehow knows the language of the beast and can use it to control people. What has he got? The fucking black speech? What is he? Literally, that's what it's like. It's <laughs> it's bizarre. Like was par parcel tongue? Yeah, it's, it's too much. It's too much. <laughs> it is not the crow. They were overthinking this. I don't. One I don't know where the quite fuck, a bit was that in the comics in the two mm, thousands. Is maybe. that what? No, and also like the thing is. The thing is, he brings Shelly back and dies in her place. But I'm like, you missed, like you miss, like you missed the point. Like the point of the the story of the graphic novel and the point of the first movie is like the loss is irreparable. The damage has been done. The only thing left is punishment. Like, and it will be divine. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, there's also yeah. like I forgot about that because then there's some. Fu they also then imply that because it's like, oh, she came back and they show like her body and his body. But then it's like, okay, well then is it is she coming back to the moment when they died? Meaning now that all those people he killed now are alive again, or is this just some fuckery and they're both their bodies are there and he's dead and don't overthink it because it doesn't matter. Time travel, Sean. They went. <laughs> yeah. Because they're doing some. Oh, that's what you said. It's time travel because they go because yeah, she wakes up at the moment of her death. So. Right, but it's also sequel bait because it ends with him like walking away, like kind of a last like you know monologue from Batman kind of thing, where he's like, "I am the knight, I am the crow," and he walks away in the limbo. I will come if I, if you're calling for me. Or uh, it's probably actually more nuanced than that, but it doesn't fucking matter. Sean, it sounds exactly like I remember in my head. So yeah. <laughs> I didn't make a sweet uh, and the the, the crow. Uh, oh, he didn't flag in uh, spaghetti. <laughs> Swedish Swedish chef. You mentioned all these people he killed, like in the in the Brandon Lee version, like everyone he kills, like the named characters, like their demise is is specific to that character and it has meaning and has emphasis and importance. And in this, he's like just snapping people in two. I'm like, I don't know who the fuck that is. Why the hell do I care? Like, I just give a <laughs> shit. It's like Neo, but with more blood. He's like stepping on a guy's neck. It's like the worst effect ever. He curb stomps some dude into the staircase of the opera. I'm like, all right, like that guy looks like he's. 
It looks like he's made out of fucking jelly. Who cares? Like, there's I don't know who that is. But he's not getting revenge per se on anybody. I mean, he does, no, these two, they're they're just goons. Like he just murdered like thirty guys. It doesn't even know. Like oh, they're just like henchmen. They're right. not like they're not directly involved he, with their death. To be fair, he does kill all the people involved. You yeah. mean all the other like. I don't even know what they are. Executives are people that also have contracts. I don't know. Yeah. They don't explain it well. There is one scene I kind of like. It's when he first comes back and like one of the cops, I guess, involved with his death is like lurking around the crime scene for some reason. And then so Eric fights him and that's when he discovers his invulnerability. But the pacing of the fight is like this dude stabs Eric. He goes down and Eric just pops back up. And this guy's like, the fuck? Uh, and then the whole fight is like this guy being like, why the fuck won't this dude just die? And Eric's like, ah! like <laughs> screaming at the body horror that's happening. I gotta mention two more things, and then I think I'm good. Okay. Uh, also, obviously, not that we even need to say it, but it's fucking in the dumpster. It's it's it's, it's fucking rotten as hell. This somehow turned into a rain review. Uh, well, movie. maybe we'll cut some of this out in the edit. We'll see how it works out. But, uh, oh, two things. One, I keep joking about the circle window. I yep. don't know if that's actually what those things are called. It's the a circular window. window. They, they don't have one in this, but they have a ring, a massive ring light in the background and a bunch of shots. I'm like, is that supposed to be the circle window? Is that like a YouTube? Like a, like a, yeah, like those like big circle light? lights. I'm like, huh, is that what that's supposed to be? And he only wears the trench coat at the end when he becomes a crow and like 10 minutes before that and then like takes it off. I hate that we have to say when he becomes the crow. That's not a thing. And they just, they made it a thing and it makes me so mad. Um, <laughs> well, well, Connor, when the blood, co- the black blood comes out of his eyes and that's where he gets the makeup from? That's what it is. Oh my God. Has no significance. It's not his wife's uh, makeup that it's he's like using. It's like a superhero at that point. Right. Well, that's what it is. It turns into a superhero movie, which I think the director even came out and said that's what he was going for. Stupid. Ugh. Uh, one of the biggest sins for me in this movie is the soundtrack, and the soundtrack is total garbage. Not even because of the track selections, because one track in particular is an excellent needle drop, the Joy Division song. I can't remember the name of it, but it's a really, really good fucking Joy Division song. And wow. then It's think- literally in there just because. Do you think that guy listens to Joy Division? Not a fucking chance. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm <laughs> no, saying. No, right. Exactly. Ironically, right? But then, like... It's not a good choice for the scene, but it's a good choice in song selection. And then later on, as Eric's getting ready to go on his murder's rampage, and he's putting his pirate coat on, and he's getting his little his little dagger, his little cutlass, and he's putting his his uh, blood paint on. Uh, Enya begins to play. Oh, he has a sword. I forgot about that. You're ready. He uses a sword to kill a bunch of people at the end. He's very particular about that. He's suiting up, going. Hum, 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 hum. I'm like, you know what? Just go full board. Just do Return to Innocence. Why don't you just do the entire Tonal Clash? He also tells like one joke when he goes full crow, like bing, literally bing, one. Bing. There's like one, <laughs> one, one, one off where it's like, oh, he's being funny now. And then he never does another one liner. Well, that sounds like a big pile of shit, guys. Yeah. So uh, go go get yourself a copy of Inertia or watch the uh, the original fan f- uh, film remake. It's on it's, YouTube for free. Uh, you so don't have to pay a streaming uh, platform to, right. to watch it. You can just watch it for free on YouTube. Uh, added added entertainment value. You can find eight uh, uploads of it, and all of it says rare student film, but they're all right there. There you yeah, go. Exactly. Uh, and you don't have to sit through Bill Skarsgård struggling to do an American accent uh, for ninety minutes. It, it's uh, it's. A shame, which it's is a damn shame, shame. And, that, and that and that that sucks. Yeah. And I, you know, we're ta- we were talking about filmmakers and their visions and things, and like you know, maybe some people shouldn't be given the money <laughs> to make film. Yeah, we <laughs> talked about that before. <laughs> maybe Rupert Sanders should be sent to the same dark place we sent Josh Trank, and maybe he should be allowed to come back. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't know. We'll talk about it. But Rupert Sanders should definitely go. <laughs> we'll see. What else has he done? Snow White and the Huntsman and... Fuck me, man. <laughs> what, like, 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 okay, so you're the guy who did Snow White and the Huntsman, and like that was your thing, like, I'm going to make the Crow remake, wow. and I'm going to make it so different and edgy. I mean, we could talk about that all day. I don't want anyway, to go off on that I'm side tangent, because it's like you even see with that new Salem slot finally coming out, you read like the, the interviews with the director, and he's like, yeah, I didn't really want to make it a horror movie. And I'm like, what? We'll see. It. We're going to cross that bridge. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> Sorry, I just that made me think of it. I will add one more thought related to that specifically. And I think it's actually kind of a weird entertainment wide thing going on right now. And George R.R. R. Martin even commented on it. He said, uh, in, like paraphrasing, if you feel the need to apply your talent to taking someone else's work and making it your own because you have no confidence in your ability to tell a story, you're in the wrong uh, career. Like, if you can't tell your own story without stealing other people's work, or not stealing them, but like 
using it as your own kind of like selfishly using it as a platform to get your own stuff out. No, write your own goddamn stories. Yeah, I totally agree with you, man. Like, please, for the love of God, contribute some originality to the slop pool that is going on right now. Like, we just talked about Happy Gilmore 2 happening before this fucking show started. And that's... I'm still upset about that. I don't fucking need that. Filling me with anger. Um... But yeah, like it's and it goes on about how this is like you know they, they, we didn't, we wanted to make it our own. That's the new thing you have now. It's happened with The Witcher. It's happened with this. It's um, uh, there was some uh, Halo. It's happened for years. Yeah, it's been happening for a long time, and now it's getting to the point where like that seems like the new trendy thing, like the multiverse. Um, you have to make it your own. No, just write your own goddamn story, please, for the love of God. And, and just if I'm not hopefully not repeating myself, but kind of just to bounce off of that thought, or. Go at it from a different angle, like these guys did. They 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 knew the movie existed. They knew they didn't have the budget. They looked at the comic, and then eventually, over the years of taking those ideas straight from the comic, they even peppered in some of their own ideas to make it like kind of flow better. And yeah. that's a that that's a way better way to go about it. And they didn't want to do it like they didn't want to do it like Brandon Lee. They did, and they right. wanted to do it more like the comic book, and that's kind of commendable just on by itself. Yeah, yeah. And like it's just a shame because like this new movie could have been a better adaption of the comic or just like right. a good, it could have been just good. And you could have ensured that this franchise would have like a, an extra life essentially and give it a more enduring quality. Instead, people are still going to consistently have to go all the way back to the beginning of it to find where it's like the best. And at no point does it ever get above that point. Like, and if you can't do any better in 30 years, stop. Just stop. Yeah. And and it's a problem and, with a lot of these franchises. And people make people make the argument, and I've heard it a million times, of like, well, this movie will let people watch the old movie. And I'm like, I don't think so. You greatly over you greatly overstate people's ability and desire to go look up these things. <laughs> yeah, I, I I don't see a general a GA audience member going. Oh, this is the crow. I'm gonna go. Wait, you mean this is a remake in 2024? Right. If they even hear that it's a fucking remake, it's the third remake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, that's what I was kind of saying earlier. So, yeah. It, I, yes, but you're right, Connor. People grossly over overestimate the fact that people are gonna go and find the original shit to watch and enjoy at that point. So. I don't know. With that being said, I'm glad I'm glad that we talked about uh, and, uh, Inertia remaking yes. The Crow, and I'm glad we can shed some light on that for some people that might have not seen it, you know, the better remake of The Crow. Yeah. <laughs> or didn't know this even existed, because yeah. I sure as hell didn't when no. you brought this to the table, and no. it... it... I, I only watched it once, but I, it's one of my favorite documentaries I've seen in the last five yeah. years. So, and, and I want to thank uh, Josh from Lunch Meat uh, VHS again for getting the rights to this and distributing it again, so that everybody can enjoy it. So I think that's really cool. Um, and again, you can get it at Lunch Meat VHS uh, on YouTube if you want to watch the whole thing of James O. Bars the Crow. And if you want a nurse, you can go to LunchMeatVHS.com and grab the the VHS. Uh, but that was. Inertia remaking the crow. The I think we'd all agree the better remake <laughs> of the so crow. far. Yeah, <laughs> so far. <laughs> Best foot forward. That's yeah. for for certain. Um, but Connor, thanks for thanks for joining us again, man. Um, oh, thanks for having me again. We loved we loved having you on the Saw episode, and we loved having you tonight. And uh, we're definitely going to be doing some more stuff going forward again. Uh, my goal tonight was uh, uh, to uh, outdo the last one. I think I did. I'm glad we had an earlier start time because I came in like I, I think it was a moment like five minutes before you guys sent me the link where I was like, <sighs> like I was super fucking <laughs> in the zone for it. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 were like you're like the fucking reverse flash. Let's take it all the way back yeah, on. You were you vibrating. Go. I had I had health in my headphones and I was waiting. I'm like fucking. Yeah, so excited for this. Um, <laughs> so uh, and I feel like uh, I I set out to accomplish uh, that goal. So thanks for having me on. This was fucking awesome. Of course, man. Don't stay away long. I'll try not to. The void may pull me back in, so I don't know. Oh, okay, fair <laughs> enough. Fair well, you got to go home sometime. Actually, that big claw is coming to take all the skin off me again. So. But yeah, let us know what you thought about um, the new Crow remake, if you want to weigh in on that, and definitely check out James O'Barr's uh, The Crow, again, like we've been saying, this, the student film, and see how you dig that, and uh, definitely check it out and uh, talk about it in the comments, let us know what you think. But until the next Ripe Review, I'm Joe LaScola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor McGraw. 